It's really nice to be with you. I know that um, there's not a lot of time left. I expect that you want to be out of here by 12. Um, we're going to try to get through as quickly as possible. If I spill over by a minute or two, I hope you will forgive me. I want to acknowledge the presence of, of, of my wife, of course, um, Phyllis, and a good old um, schoolmate, uh, Conrad Charles from Antigua, but he lives in this area, so I told him, I'm going to be close to you. Come on down. We won't charge you anything for sitting. So, so he came. <laughs> um, let me save the time. I, I just want to encourage you again that you have a special assembly. It was just a blessing for me to sit and hear the things that were shared this morning. Um, and I really didn't feel um, a, a need to add to it. I was just absorbing it. I go to a very small assembly, and um, sometimes you wish people would share more, and you come to this assembly, and it's like pop, pop, pop. People are having things to say, and I was blessed by the testimony as well. So um, be encouraged. The Lord is um, among you, and he is moving. That, that's really great. Um, let us have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for giving this opportunity to share from your word the basic passage from the book of Psalms, a passage that perhaps everyone has read several times. What new can be said here? Maybe nothing new, but maybe a reminder of who you are. So as we share it today, Lord, may it be a blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, have you been wondering if it makes sense to stick with this Christian faith? Is there anything about your Christian commitment that makes you feel disheartened, disoriented, dissatisfied? Are the ways of this world so foreign to you and to your nature that you feel like you're under threat, like a a little rabbit running away from a predator. Sometimes I feel that way. The great news is that God has placed in Psalm 46 11 verses that have helped me, certainly, over the past years of my Christian walk. And I'm confident that those verses will help you as well. It begins with, God is our refuge. I want to revisit this short psalm today and focus on one central theme being experienced by believers today. And that is the apparent declining influence of God in society. And should we be worried about it? The authorship of Psalm 46 is ascribed to the sons of Korah. The significance of the sons of Korah is this. You would remember that the original Korah was a skeptic and an influencer who deviously accused Moses and Aaron of lording it over the refugee assembly moving from Egypt to Canaan. He accused Moses of treating certain people in a special way playing favorites, and in response, God destroyed Korah with a mighty earthquake and all of those who were with him. And you can find that story in the book of Numbers. Therefore, when you see sons of Korah or the descendants of Korah as writers of a psalm, we are hearing from the people who know what it's like to experience the fierce correction of God, but his awesome goodness. And with that context in mind, we can see that the descendants of Korah in this case 
having learnt the lesson, are now making this declaration about God. God is our refuge and strength. Now, a refuge is generally a place where you go when you're under threat. Uh, you go to a person who will use his strength and resources to protect you, the one who is being pursued, usually until some authority can hear your case out and figure out what's going on here. The refugee is the person under pressure. Sometimes it's from political pressure. Sometimes it's from precarious legal circumstances. Sometimes it's from natural circumstances, such as starvation and homelessness. Well, everyone at some point in their lives will need a refuge, and therefore, by definition, will be a refugee. Canada is a refuge for places around the world. Every year, we give refuge to at least 125,000 people. That's a lot of people over the past decade. But by contrast, God welcomes millions and millions of people who desperately seek him for rest for their weary bodies and for their troubled spirits. Verse 1 of our text says, God is our refuge and strength. He's the one who is interested in providing refuge and has the ability to keep us safe. That's the reference to strength. Further, in verse 1 of our text, he is an ever-present help when we are in trouble. The message here is that he never leaves us. He's ever-present. When all has failed for the Christian refugee, there's always a hand strong enough to save us and close enough to reach us. Now, you may reasonably ask, save us from what? In verses 2 and 3, you see the answer there. Save us from the destructive power of natural forces. That's what it would seem. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake at their surging. You get the sense here of natural disaster. And this psalm would never have been written if there were not a list of things that could naturally cause us to seek cover, to run and seek cover. That list could include fire, earthquakes, accidents, terrorism, building collapses. The result of all of that is the same. It is utter fear and suffering. But the scripture declares that we do not have to fear. Because God is our refuge. Now the earth giving way is a reference to the failure of the very things in which we have the strongest confidence. When we're flying in a plane, for example, and there's belly heaving turbulence, where do you want to go? You want to get down to the ground. Terra firma. Because firm ground is the only answer to a plane that's in free fall or being tossed about on a raging tide. Reaching land is the only place you want to go. But what happens when the ground fails, when the very road on which you are traveling gives way, such as happened in this last couple of weeks in a bridge in Baltimore? What happens when mountains where the strong, the victorious, the powerful live, are threatened with even more menacing waters that will undercut mighty mountains. What happens then? When there is massive natural disruption that threatens our very existence, when there is great annihilation, or at least a threat of it, the sons of Korah say, we should know that God is our refuge. 
that's not the end of it. You know, I've often heard this message quoted when there's a death in a family, when the breadwinner, for example, is taken away by a sudden accident. The person would tell the wife and the children, God will be your refuge and strength. You can turn to God. He will not leave you. He will not leave the righteous, forsaken, and afraid. And that is indeed solid ministry, solid advice. And I would encourage all who are going through physical challenges, financial crisis, and even mourning today, to hold on to this promise that's in Psalm 46. Because God cares about your physical and emotional needs. However, truth be told, physical deliverance from natural disasters is not guaranteed. There is a promise, though, that he will be ever present, even in the midst of physical disaster. God will be ever present. And if God is our refuge and ever present help, he will therefore protect us. Now, when you read verses 2 and 3 of our text in a literal sense, you kind of get that sense of reassurance that if there's a, a, a snowstorm tomorrow, if there's a tornado tomorrow, God is with me. He will bring me through. But when you read verses 4 through 11, you will see that a figurative reading of the text is more powerful. And from the Matthew Henry's commentary, we're encouraged to apply these terms, mountains, seas, waters, to spiritual enemies. That's what they are. And according to Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, all these are figurative expressions denoting the chaotic confusions and the disorders that have been and will be in the world. Will you ask, well, what are these things that they could be talking about? And there are several classes. For example, they might be denoting financial upheaval. They might be de denoting medical. They might be talking about sociopolitical issues. They might be talking about intellectual issues as well. I don't have the time to go through all of these, so I'm going to just choose one today. And I want to talk about the intellectual threat. The much criticized belief that there is a God who defines right and wrong, who is worthy of honor and sovereignly determines the notion of right and wrong. Do you agree that Christians are, if not under threat, we feel under threat because our sense of what is right and wrong is fundamentally different from what the majority of the world would view as right and wrong? You know, until the end of the 1800s, this concept of a God to be worshipped and respected was kind of accepted by most people. And it was forming the basis of our moral code. And although script, um, skeptics and atheists had existed for thousands of years until that time, very few people were willing to say, mm, I don't think we need God. We can get along without him. But the 20th century changed all of that. In just uh, over a hundred years, all of that changed. And the tide has turned, and now in the 21st century, one has to be very brave to publicly state, on Christ the solid rock I stand. We can say that in church, 
but you have to be really strong to say it out there. You have to be very confident to say that on a political platform. You have to be confident to say that in the workplace. Well, you might or might not be aware, but early in the 1900s, there emerged a group of thought leaders, influencers, who started questioning the source of man's moral code. And one notable influencer was Durant Drake. I don't know if that rings a bell, but he wrote a book in 1928. It's called The New Morality. Morality, just simply put, is defining what is right or wrong. For example, is racism right or wrong? Is genocide okay? Is sexual promiscuity okay? Is stealing, lying, being a false witness, enriching yourself on the, at the expense of others? These are moral questions. And the Bible actually has very firm views about them. But let's hear what Duran Drake thinks about the Christian notion of morality. And I'm going to read from his New Morality. In short, Durant Drake says, morality is not something imposed on us from without. He's saying, morality is not something that God defined. It is an expression of his own man's own needs. It is the product of natural selection. When you see that term natural selection, it's it refers to over time shifting, changing, adjusting, you know. And he's saying that's what morality is. Um, the ascription of morality to supernatural sources is, not irre is only irrelevant. In fact, it is not only irrelevant, it is dangerous. So we have a problem here. The Christian says, I can't define what is right or wrong. I believe God should tell me what is right or wrong, and I will live according to the way that God defines right or wrong. Durant Drake says, no, you define what's right or wrong. Why do why you expect somebody from outside to tell you what's right or wrong? You define right or wrong yourself. Do you see the problem that we're having here? In another book, Durant Drake um, wrote this, no voice from without, even of a creator or ruler of the universe, could alter the duties inherent in the very nature and conditions of human life, now that it exists. Such a command could not make right other than right or wrong other than wrong. But this is the piece that um, grates me a little bit. If God is a conscious being, aware of and interested in our fortunes, he does, he does no doubt wishes to do right, but the rightness or wrongness of an act is independent of his desires and just as real if there were no such being interested in it. So he's saying, we don't need God. God is only telling you to do things because he knows it's right. But if there were no God, it would still be right. I can tell you that you just leave society to live on its own, and you'll find out the answer there. It will be total chaos. Everyone for himself, everyone saying, what I'm doing is right. Don't tell me what to do. But you, you can see where all of this is heading. A kind of selfish definition of what's right or wrong. Perhaps the last one that I'll quote for you is from something that was written not long ago by a person called Jeremy Rifkin. And I'll skip over some of the other things that he said, but this is the part that he says, we create the world, and because we do, human beings, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer, longer have to justify our behavior. We are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible for nothing outside of ourselves. We are, um, we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And clearly you can see the parallel. The Lord Jesus prayed and said, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You set the 
the, the standards for us. Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin says, no, we are smart enough. Um, we set it and we are not beholden to anyone. And it is this feeling of helplessness being experienced that gives the believer the sense of, you know what? I don't feel like I belong in this world. For over a hundred years, the new morality is dominating our schools, our newspapers, our radio stations, our television shows. And we don't know where to turn because we don't fit in. Yet, Psalm 46 says, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake at their surging. This is the reference that we're dealing with here. The earth given way is not just a reference to earthquakes, bridge failures, landslides. It is a metaphor for the Jodia Christian principles that have undergirded civilization for the past three millennia, going into free fall. Principles are now changing faster than legislatures can debate them. They're more far-reaching than the nation's judges can foresee them and more devious than the church can even anticipate them. So we feel our only hope is to run to God for his protection. And in the midst of this tsunami of faithlessness, God invites us into his city, the city of God. Now, take, let's take a look at the city of God. Because that is where our protection is. And we can read that in verses 4 through 9 for a panoramic view of God's city of refuge. Remember, the, the psalm started with God is a refuge. So think of a group of people who are refugees going through some vast expanse. And the only place where you have, you know you have support is to find the city of God. Picture yourself, therefore, standing on a deck, looking out over the city of God. What do you see? Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. First of all, in contrast to the confusion of verses 2 and 3, the psalmist points us to a river that protects the outer edges of the city of God from the threatening floods and landslides. Notice that it's referring to a stream, a gentle stream. In the earlier part of the, the passage, we're talking about raging waters, and there's a difference here. Also, this is clearly not a, part, a, a place on earth. It says God is within her. Which place, which city on earth does God live in? I know you're tempted to think Jerusalem. But God is everywhere. And this is not a description of a physical city. The streams of the city of God provide reliable water supply and precious water. That water supply will not fail. No matter how long the enemy tries to lay siege to this city, every day, consistently, the refugees of God will have what they need. What does a stream symbolize in Scripture? It symbolizes salvation, eternal life, its divine guidance. You can see references to that in Isaiah 12:3. Isaiah 55, 1, Revelations 21, 6, and so on. Every day, God will remind us whose we are, who we are, and what is our eternal destiny. And as we continue to look through, look outside from the city of God, we observe in Psalm, um, verse 6 of Psalm 46, nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall, and he lifts his voice, and the earth melts. This is a direct reflection of the political and military instability of the world. 
whether we think of the Russia-Ukraine situation or Hamas in Israel or Israel in Gaza, a truck blockade in Ottawa, it doesn't matter. They are different degrees, but the same thing. These are examples of nations in uproar. But what is clear is this, that God only has to lift his voice. And like the waters of the Sea of Galilee that he calmed, all of these situations will respond to his command. I have a, I have a confession to make. Do you know how many hours I've watched TV over the past 14 years, 10 years, looking at the Russia-Ukraine situation? Because I'm a junkie for news. And I keep looking, look, what's happening today? You know, waste of time. When all I had to do was to read verse 9 of Psalm 46. Verse 8 says, come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on earth. And then verse 9, he makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. The psalmist is telling us that there will come a time, as unlikely as it may seem, when the wrong shall fail and the right prevail. And you may ask, when will that happen? And God will answer, in my time. Be still, verse 10, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nation. I will be exalted in the earth. It's like God saying, stop worrying. I will not be erased just because someone says that I don't exist. If just because someone says that they make the rules. Just because a certain theme may be driving the day. It doesn't mean that you don't have a place of safety. Stop the worry. Well, believe it or not, this time has gone. So let me try to wrap up quickly. There are two declarations that we have at the tail end of Psalm 46. One I've spoken about already. God saying, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. This declaration is the one who gives refuge. Remember, God thunders from his holy city to the enemies who are pursuing us. And he says, come, come no further. For these people who are within this refuge are mine. And I will defend them mightily. The second declaration though is in verse 11. And this is the declaration of the refugees. They're living in, within the walls of the city. And they have seen how the Lord has defended them. And like the person who has survived a giant tsunami. Or maybe a person who has come through trying situations that they never thought that they would survive, they stand and look out at the destruction and they're still safe. And they're saying, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I saw an example of that this week when a father was called to uh, the site of an accident where his daughter had um, undergone or had experienced a massive, an unsurvivable accident. Saw it on the news. And when he got there, he thought he was going to see his dead daughter. He saw a daughter who was barely scratched. And his only response could be, God is an awesome God. It is this sense in which the refugee is making a declaration here. He is not taunting the people on the outside. He's just saying, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And so what if the God of Jacob is our refuge? Well, a couple of things you can do. Um, number one, if you're in the refuge, stay there. If you're not in the refuge, get there. Like our brother who testified this morning, he found that he was outside the refuge. And he went there and gave his life to the Lord. Second, stay in the refuge. Because only there will you be sheltered in the arms of God. Now, refuge can be an uncomfortable place. might be comfortable. 
It might be anywhere in the world. But if you stay in the refuge, in God's safe arms, you will be safe. Number three, be helpful to those other refugees. You know, tell others how to get there. Encourage those who are afraid. They're, they're in the refuge, but they're still afraid. They're traumatized. What God doesn't want is a dissatisfied refugee. They're being provided food, clothing, shelter, protection, and they're still complaining. What kind of refugee is that? God has already declared you safe. He's providing protection for you. Be thankful. Tell others about what the Lord has done for you. You know, Psalm 46 is applicable to anything. The mighty hand of God is our refuge, verse 1 and verse 7. We can depend on him in physical trouble. But the thought of God is our refuge, verse 2. And by retaining God in our knowledge, we can ensure that he will be ever-present. The commanding voice of God is our refuge, verses 6. Verse 6, so that in the confusion of this world, even that is subject to the voice of God. Verses 8 and 9, the sovereign purpose of God is our refuge. In war or peace, God is making out his purposes so we don't have no need to fear. Our refuge is not a, a nation, not a political leader or party. It is not a social media influencer, not a global power in the east or west. It is not wealth or poverty. It is not health or social safety net. It is not an emergency response system. It is not our ignorance of science or our progress in science. None of those are our refuge. God is. So what happens when someone says to you, you are delusional because you believe in God? Do you shrivel up and you make preparations to leave the faith? No, you shouldn't. You know, I work... My work involves leading a group of scientists. And should I feel that, like I need to switch out from God because of what my colleagues believe? I don't think so. In fact, I know some of them might be believers. But I can tell you this. I'm determined that my declaration to them will always be in my research, in my decisions concerning intellectual debates, in my management decisions, in my spiritual victories and failures, in issues of life or death, in the safety of my family, in eternity, God is my refuge and strength. And I'm glad he is. And I hope you are glad he is. Stay there and enjoy his protection. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us of these words. Because you are our strength when everything else fails. We can run to you. Oh yes, we know that we are an army. We know that we are a church. We also know that we are a group of pilgrims traveling through a barren foreign land. Sometimes we need protection as refugees. We are glad you are. Bless this church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I know that if you don't invite me for the next 10 years, that's because I stayed too long. But, <laughs> but um, I give thanks to the Lord for this time.